So we should see that kick up in a second. Are you getting a notification the recording started? It's yep. happened. There we go. All right, let's start over. <laughs> yeah, no, that's cool. How about you kick into the meeting etiquette, Dan, and then I'll kick it off yep. from there. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, we are recording this meeting. Uh, so uh, just so you know, if you're on video and stuff, it might get picked up on the recording. Um, initially, I've, mute, I've muted all of the participants, but when it comes time to uh, raise questions, uh, we will unmute people if they want to ask a question. So what I would ask you to do is to use the raise hand feature that's in Teams. So that's that little icon with the hand, uh, if you see it. If you don't see that, you can always just uh, type in the chat, say, I have a question and, uh, and we'll call on you. Uh, or if you prefer not to speak, uh, we can, you can type your question in the chat and we'll address, uh, address those as well. So um, with that, we'll kick on to the, uh, to the news and I'll let Damien take over. Fantastic. So welcome guys uh, to the March Azure, Brisbane Azure user group. We've got a special guest lined up for tonight. So that's really awesome. And for all those who can see, this is a special space edition of the Azure News Group. So uh, for those of you who know what this means, well done. For those of you who don't, you guys need to pick up your game. So welcome to March. But the hint is space. All right, let's kick it over. First off, let's give us a big shout out to our sponsors. So our, our sponsors have helped us and they, they maintain this group. Um, they're fantastic. They've been super supportive all the way through COVID and all of this challenging last year. So big thanks out to Codify. They've been awesome and big thanks out to Microsoft. So Microsoft's always there to help us when we need them. So that's great too. Just admit that. Awesome. So getting involved. So one of the things about this user group is it, it can't be possible without everybody here. Um, and everybody who's going to look at this online later on. So please put up your hand, kick over the next slide, Dan. So put up your hand, get involved. We've got places free. So if you're fast, you can secure your spot now. That sounds like a marketing ad and it is because we want you to get involved. So let us know, um, reach out to Dan, reach out to myself. Uh, we really want to hear from you. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be a small thing and we can get a bunch of people together if need be. Uh, it's more about what's your experience with Azure? Have you seen something that you like, something you don't like? Look, doors open. <laughs> Let us know what you want to say, uh, except if you're an AWS fan and you've got something to hate about Azure. But you know, <laughs> apart from that, feel free. <laughs> Let us know. Awesome. So um, next slide. Right into the updates. Right into the updates. That's cool. We can skip that. <laughs> so there's been a bunch of things that have that have uh, dropped in the last month, which has been pretty cool. Um, so Azure Depend Defender is coming for app service. So we're all kind of familiar with Azure Defender for your PC. Well, it's now coming to app service. So um, there's a few things that it's doing. So it can it can detect uh, you know large DDoS sort of attacks that are kind of pick away at your app service. And, and also one of the big things that's announced is the dangling DNS uh, sub, you know, subdomain takeover sort of attack that you can do if you deprovision, you forget about things, people can uh, take over your domain and, and that's less cool. So Defender's there to sort of step in and help you. It does cost money. I think it was 15 bucks, I, I can't remember. Something like that. It's not a huge amount for your app service, but um, yeah, it's there, it's great. Uh, so move it on. Dan. <laughs> awesome. So here's the uh, the space news for tonight. Um, it sounds like I'm a space group, not an Azure group. But anyway, so Spaceborne Computer 2, it, it's basically come along. It's, it's upgrading the uh, ISS's uh, computing power and it's connecting the ISS directly to Azure. So now the ISS is is connecting to Azure from the edge, uh, like literally from the edge of space. Um, and it's a pretty cool computer. One of the things they've done with this one is it's a, it's a standard computer. It's not one of these hardened computers. 
yeah, I think it was still about 20,000 bucks for the computer. So it's not a super cheap laptop, but it, it goes pretty good and it's directly connected to Azure. That's a Cygnus uh, space um, upper stage that you can see there that's docking to the ISS. Unfortunately, it's not SpaceX, but that's cool. Um, <laughs> Northrop, is it Northrop or Grumman? Grumman, they, they do a great job with their resupply stuff too. So that's really awesome. Uh, next slide, Dan. Uh, yeah, Azure Firewall Premium. Um, Azure Firewall Premium has a bunch of things that's, uh, that's gone into preview um, and some awesome things that, that really can help those scenarios where you need a firewall. So TLS inspection, uh, you know, a whole bunch of things that you can see there on the screen. Um, so if you're using Azure Firewall, you probably check out Azure Firewall Premium um, for some extra features. Um, so next one is Spark 3.0 compatibility connector for Azure SQL and, and uh, on-prem SQL as well, but I really care about Azure. So you know, this is for the Azure Spark um, workloads. It's, it's like a SQL bulk APIs, and, and so it's, it's helpful to get those workloads into Azure Spark. Oh, sorry, Spark, yeah, I said that right. Um, moving on, so front door. Um, we've now got two SKUs for front door, so this is pretty cool. Um, I, everyone knows I'm a bit of a front door fan, except their firewall policies because they suck, and I'm really having a lot of trouble with their firewall, but they're over, over aggressive on their firewall rules. Um, bit of a tit for tat going between the firewall team and the um, ASP.NET team. Um, sorry, I digress. I'm just having Azure front door issues at the moment. So anyway, um, what can I say? So the, the new uh, SKU allows you to do bring things like private links. So for those of you who don't know, private link allows you to provide um, a network boundary around your SaaS uh, components that that was a big one for me that stood out it's about 200 bucks um so it's it's not super cheap but on the plus side the original SKU has dropped down to about i don't know i think we're running at about 40 50 dollars something like that so that's come down like by a factor of three so that's really cool so i'm super keen for this because i only want the cheap one um and putting front door in front of your web loads in Azure. Look, you can't beat it. It's a great way. It's a great way to do things to get your WAF in an isolated networking, oh, sorry, isolated resources that apply to your application that you're deploying. Uh, strongly encourage anyone out there who wasn't aware of uh, front door or doesn't know what it's about, check it out. It's a great way to put the same sort of IaaS controls in front of your PaaS workloads. It's really good. Um, yeah, I think that's enough about big enough plug for front door, surely. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so so this is my bad. Like that slide sucks. Apologies, the title I forgot that bit at the top. Um, so quota management. So so quotas are a, a big part of Azure, and you can you can you know when you get into your billing and quotas, you can you can allocate certain amounts to different workloads, and you can work within your limits. Um, quota management gives you the ability to use APIs to programmatically adjust those quotas. So when you have an unexpected workload or increase in volume, you can then account for that, adjust, and pivot. Um, these APIs let you get into it programmatically rather than using the portal, so that's great. Um, don't know what else to say. It's pretty pretty cool if if you are using quotas. If if you're not using quotas and you're just using scale, like that's fine too. But if you are into the quotas, this stuff here is going to help you a lot. All right, and final final little tidbit here is um, Azure Arc. So Azure Arc is one of these things that coming along pretty pretty strongly for Azure and it's really good. So for all of those AWS and Google fans out there, 
Well, you, you can now use AWS and Google Kubernetes clusters to host your Azure workloads. So that's what Azure Arc does. It allows you to have a, a common uh, Azure experience across all of your different cloud providers. So it gives you that multi-cloud, uh, I should say, and on-prem for certain workloads as well. So um, APIM is one of those ones where you can span in Azure Arc across your on-prem and other clouds. Um, but what we've had in the last month is we've had some of the machine learning services drop to Azure Arc. So there's already things like uh, SQL, File, APIM, like a bunch of the, the core things that you're going to need to run your workloads. And this is just expanding and getting better and better. So that's really, really cool to see Azure Arc maturing. And now um, even even Logic Apps can run now in, yeah. in container Logic Apps version two, which uses the functions runtime, which is awesome. And so Azure Arcs, I'm sure a lot of people are waiting for something, some better user experience. It's not the best. <laughs> I just I just say it's not the best user experience from a, if you're used to using the portal. Um, but look, if you're not used to using the portal, Azure Arc is is your go to. It's really good. But if you're used to that portal experience, well, we're not quite there yet, but it's coming. Like I'm sure, well, I don't know for a fact, but it'd be strange if it didn't, right? Um, so Azure Arc just gives you that ability to extend into the other clouds. Every, well, not everyone, lots and lots of companies are looking for multi-cloud strategies. And this here, it's pre-canned, multi-cloud, and then you can just use the resources like as if you're in Azure. It's pretty cool. Haven't heard of anything else similar, so big big props for that. A few, I think I'll plug a few events coming up. Um, so integration down under, we've got somebody very close by who, who uh, <laughs> is helping to run that one as well. So <laughs> Dan, you're a champion. You're out there, you're supporting lots and lots of user groups, and that's awesome to see. Um, but uh, it's a great event as well. So if you're in, interested in integration, you want to get involved, have a chat to Dan. I, I'll give you a tip. Yeah, it's a shortcut into the conversation. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yep, we uh, we meet every second Thursday night of, uh, of the month. And then I think there's not a whole lot more. So into the resources. We got a we got a Slack channel. Uh, Dan's super diligent. I, I'm gonna forward my apologies now. I'm less diligent than Dan. He's awesome. So if if you're interested in the Slack channel, drop in, say hello. YouTube, it's great. <laughs> it's it's where this is gonna be. Uh, some some learning resources. The 30 days to learn it was a was a has been refreshed or is about to be refreshed. I'm not sure what I'm allowed to say, but um, definitely check it out. There's a lot of new stuff coming in the 30 days to learn it. Was it last month? I think, Dan, I can't remember. Anyway, that's good. It's a really good uh, way to sort of consume a lot of the Azure topic. Uh, it's They provide little courses, 30 days, to try and get you across all the stuff you want to know about certain areas. Um, <clears throat> these, these are just a couple of my favorite blogs. Um, happy if anyone wants to put up any other blogs, but um, I, I think uh, Scott's are great, both of them. Um, and the Azure blog is one I use all the time. Uh, I'll have to put my hand up and say I'm not a good IT ops person. In fact, I'm not an IT ops person, I'm a dev. Uh, so I haven't really visited the IT ops blog that much, but uh, I've been assured that it's really good, and that's why that's on that there. So if anyone else has got like a, you know, fanatical, this is the best blog you should go to for Azure, let us know. We'll put it up here. Cool. And uh, we will be sharing these slides, by the way, so you don't have to worry about, uh, you know, frantically writing down the links. Uh, the slides will be shared on the on the Meetup group. So. Awesome. So. Without any further ado, I, I want to introduce to you Martin Clary. He's uh, Associate Capability Lead for, uh, for Data of Telstra Purple. 
uh, Microsoft MVP, MCT. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about the, um, the the power and flexibility of ADX and Custo query language. So I'm, with that, I think I want to hand it over to Martin um, and big welcome from Melbourne. Thank you, guys. I will uh, get my screen up and shared. So hopefully that should be up for you guys now. Yep, we can see that. Perfect. Cool. OK, so let's have a look at exploring the world of uh, Azure Data Explorer. So uh, thanks for the, the intro there. I'm just going to jump back to that one because I think it's kind of cool that it, it fits into the, the little bit of space theme that we were going with there. Um, so a little bit of a journey through space for us there, joining the ISS and the Azure Cloud up there. Uh, a little bit about myself. Um, as mentioned, I'm the uh, Capability Lead for Data at Telstra Purple, based here in Melbourne, um, and uh, MVP in the data platform. I've uh, done a whole heap of the, the Azure certifications and the Microsoft certifications over many, many years of doing training as well. Um, so, yeah, I've uh, started on the data platform back in the last century. So difficult to, to, to go with that one with my youthful good looks there, obviously. But, um, yeah, that kind of works out as quite a long while of working with, uh, with SQL Server and all the related technologies since then as well. So what are we going to look at tonight? First of all, I'm going to take you through just you know, what Azure Data Explorer actually is. Um, get, let's get the, the core bits out of that, find out what we can do with it. How do you get started? How do you spin up the service? How do you start to ingest data into it to start using the power of it? Um, and the, the introduction to the, the Crystal Query language, which um, is common across a lot of the, the, the additional platforms here. So with Data Explorer, Log Analytics, it will give you that same pattern of querying the data across there. So it's good that you can kind of learn and, uh, and give things a, across the various platforms there. And then we'll look at a number of ways of consuming the insights. So it's all very well getting the data in, doing all the processing, but how do we get some value out from that as well? So we'll look at that towards the, the end. So first of all, you know, what is Azure Data Explorer? It is something there which is designed really for that, um, that initial exploration of your data sets. Uh, it gives you a very low latency ingestion into it uh, and massive scalability. Uh, you can scale it up to be able to cope with terabytes within minutes. Uh, the speed of it, we can get something like 20 megabytes per second uh, per node of data ingestion. So again, as you scale out the way, you can see that that will give you a, a massive improvement in scale there as well. But it's aimed at, uh, at read-only type queries. You're not looking to, to use this as a, as a database per se. It's not the sort of thing that you want to be um, trying to, you know, to build your applications and use it as the back end. It's more for where you already have these large data sets and want to, you know, to see what insights there are actually in it in a quick manner. Uh, the speed of that, you know, a billion records in less than one second. If you're using anything that's sort of structured or semi-structured, you know, sort of like JSON-like data that you're pulling in from, all of that can be done really, really quickly. Uh, it's great for things like uh, doing term searches across your data, uh, doing calculations. You've got, you know, some real power there to do a uh, massive amount of uh, calculations and manipulations. And time series uh, analytics, again, something there, I'm starting to look across that, what's been happening with my data over a period of time. Um, you can almost get that with uh, streaming the data in there and optimizing it that way, and near real time monitoring across that to be able to, you know, to query and pull out the insights and find things that are going on there. So uh, perhaps your, your security logs is something you would want to, to send in there and start to, to look at things across that 
and pull out anything that seems to be an anomaly on that almost as soon as it happens. It is, uh, as most Azure services are, fully managed. Um, it gives you uh, the ability to set uh, auto scale. Uh, now that can be outwards and upwards on there as well. Uh, pay for use as most Azure services are. And the benefit of that, and compared to some of these other uh, large query platforms, you're not paying by the query. You're actually just paying, you know, regularly by the by time. So how long you actually use the platform, how long it's up for, um, and your storage can be set to be quite flexible on that as well. So again, you can have things aging out over a period of time to keep your data sets within the the realm that you actually need there. As I suggested earlier, it's the same sort of uh, platform that underpins some of the other. Uh, Azure services, so Azure Monitor uh, is built on top of uh, Azure Data Explorer. Uh, Windows Defender makes use of that for some of its querying and comparison and analytics. Um, same with uh, things like Advanced Threat Protection, you know, that's something that's used with uh, Azure SQL. Um, and um, it gives a number of different uh, avenues into there. So it will open up a, an API for building your own connections into it um, and can be deployable through ARM templates. And there's a number of different client libraries that we can use for connecting uh, our own services, our own applications into it as well. Really you know, useful things like uh, IoT. So pushing that in uh, straight off your devices and then starting to pull the, the analytics for it, looking for the insights, feeding that back out into to other analytics tools. Um, as I you know, suggested earlier, you know, a lot of uh, big data platforms and patterns, uh, security logs, looking through vast quantities of that in near real time. Um, but it can also be used as the, the introduction into things like your, your ML modeling. Uh, it opens up in that with the, the query language as well to start pulling out the things that you would use for your modeling, spotting those bits, building those models within there as well. So you can use it almost like an experimentation space before you then go back to your source data and, and implement those models uh, and the, the ML and AI aspects into there as well. And you have that bit of uh, perhaps using that and embedding it into your own application. So because of the, the, the fairly open APIs into it, it's really easy to, to add other bits there, uh, have it pulling out, having it compare bits of data, being able to, to set up uh, partitioned data sets so that you've got different bits of data from different customers that they can keep their own data separate, but giving you the option of pulling things together in the bigger sense across your applications to see what's happening there. So in that sort of data warehousing workflow, you're going to have all these, you know, these data sets now. And, and really with um, the modern data warehouse approach, it's something there where it, you know, it's, it's not, so, not so controlled uh, or so static as the, you know, the, your traditional data warehousing was. You've got the ability now to ingest so many different data sources really easy through things like uh, Azure Data Factory and to pull that in and land it somewhere. Now, before you then go ahead and start to, to build things out like your, your ML models, your, your data warehouses, your data marts for your, your analytics and your end consumers, your BI reporting, you really want an idea of what's there, how it's all pulling together. Can I actually you know, do a large scale query across things to ensure that what I'm expecting from one data source, uh, if I want to join that to another data source, I want to make sure that you know there isn't any anomalies there, that I do have the, the data quality that's going to pull that in. When there's vast amounts of data, doing that through traditional approaches can be difficult, it can be slow, it can be difficult to get the, uh, the scale that you need for it, and needs an awful lot more in, in preparation. Um, Data, the Azure Data Explorer gives you a little bit more flexibility in that, of being able to, to manipulate data more easily and with the vast scales and do it more quickly and explore through there. So nice and easy to get started. Um, the first thing you'll do is create your Data Explorer cluster. 
you've got again some very fine grained control over this because it's really built up from pretty much standard VMs. So you can define which compute specification you want to use for the machines your cluster is going to run on. So that can go down as low as uh, D11 V2s. So you've got there two CPUs, uh, 14 gig of RAM, you know, fairly lightweight machines. So if you want something that's a small uh, cluster just to play with, you can run with that and keep your costs down fairly low. That can scale up to uh, the DS14s, uh, and they have 16 CPUs uh, and up to 112 gig of RAM each. You can then scale that out over a number of machines as well. So you've got that, that upward scalability and what size of machine, plus the number of VMs that you're specifying there. If you need it uh, for uh, high level redundancy, you can build it up over availability zones as well. And then you can decide what type of scaling do you want? Do you want it to auto scale? So, you know, do you need that increase, you know, as the system needs it? So as your queries need it, as your data storage needs it, do you want it to automatically go with that? Or do you want to keep better control of your costs and only scale it when you want to and when you're ready to do it? You've got that option on there as well. You can enable it for things like um, streaming ingestion. So again, it optimizes it that way to allow the data to come in uh, a little bit more quickly. So if you want that very low latency um, between ingestion and availability for query, you can set it up to, to do the, the ingestion. And typically then when you set it up with that configuration, you're looking at uh, a maximum of about 10 seconds from the point of ingestion to the point of it being available within your queries to process. So you know, nice and quick through there. It does tip over though at about uh, four gig per hour per table that you're streaming data into. Uh, and that's around about the tipping point where you go, okay, I don't want to go ahead with, uh, with streaming on this one. I don't have the, the capacity to do that. And I'd want to switch that off and look at a more batch-based ingestion process on there. Your other option is um, whether you want to, to completely purge your data on delete. Um, now that adds, again, a bit more overhead because it, it consumes a bit more to go through with uh, removing the, the data completely. That might be important. Um, if you're working with uh, you know, international data and worldwide and maybe impacted by GDPR regulations, for example, if you've got EU data that you're dealing with, that might be important that you can confidently say, I'm removing all of the data uh, when requested to or, or needed to. So that is, is one option you can do from there. However, when it does do it, it does take quite a bit of time and resources uh, to consume to do that. So it's probably not something, unless you really need to, to have that option, that, uh, that you want to do. And the final bit you've got control of is, uh, is whether you set it up um, in your specific virtual network environment. You can let it uh, deploy into its own one by default, but you have that option of having the fine grain control of saying, no, I want to put it into you know, my, my environment, have control over it, and then restrict you know, what's got access into the, the VNet there for a little bit more security. So let's have a look at how easy that is to, to get things set up. So I just want to come in to the portal. I'm going to create a Azure Data Explorer cluster. Go ahead and add one. Pick my resource group I want to put it into, give it a name. Uh, restrictions on the name is it has to be all uh, lowercase or numbers, no underscores or dashes in that one. Um, I can pick my region for that. And then whether my, my what the sort of um, workload I'm going to be running on this. So if I'm just playing with it, I can select the dev test. If I do that, I don't get a big choice on the size options from it. If I go into a standard one, I get a little bit more in terms of you know, what sort of size I want to look at uh, immediately, whether it's a uh, you know, medium or large on there. If it's storage optimized, I can go compute organized. 
it gives me again a little bit more flexibility on there. Once I select from that, I get a default suggestion of what that uh, compute specification, what VM I should be using from that. But I do have the choice to go in there and say, give me all of the options. Um, and I can say, you know, I can take my filters off here. You say select all, select all from there. And I start to get more choices out of here as to, you know, what type of, uh, of machine do I want underpinning my cluster here? So uh, I can select one from there, decide whether I want to, to use availability zones. My option here on the scaling, whether it's manual or uh, the auto scale, how many instances do I want to start from on here? And then whether I want to enable my streaming ingestion and my data purging from there. Some more around uh, encryption system identities, depending upon how this is going to interface with uh, with other systems, how do I want to, to manage that? And whether I want to put it into my, my own virtual network or just let it pick one and go ahead and do that. That's all that needs to be configured for it. From there, I can go ahead, click uh, Create on this uh, and kick off the creation of my cluster. It takes a few minutes to build everything together, you know, depending obviously upon the size that you want to build. So the number of nodes that are going to be underpinning it, uh, how much is there? That needs a bit of time to, to do things. It's roughly, if you go with just the dev test environment, it'll be somewhere between five and 10 minutes to do the, the full creation of things on there. And then obviously depending on, you know, are you creating the, uh, the other aspects around things like the virtual network at the same time, if you're deploying into an existing one, that'll save a little bit of time that way. But that's, that's roughly the time scale that you can expect from there. So now into the fun stuff, how do I actually go ahead with loading and querying the data into my uh, Data Explorer cluster. So there's a number of bits that are reasonably straightforward and, and well set up for it to be able to, to do this. Uh, Event Hub can set it up really easy to go with the streaming ingestion uh, and get to that sort of millions of events per second from there. Uh, and that's, again, a really straightforward process. And there's now some helpers available to, to do that for you as well. And we'll have a look at some of these options as we go through it. If you're uh, looking for automatic updates from your storage accounts, Event Grid can help to trigger that. So whenever some new uh, blobs are pushed into your container, have that automatically send them through into your, your table. IoT Hub, like Event Hub, again, reasonably straightforward to set up there as well. And with Azure Data Factory, it gives you the option of Data Explorer both being a source and a sync. So you can be querying data from an existing uh, data explorer cluster, perhaps doing some processing, filtering, or whatever on the data there, and then moving that off somewhere else. So again, you might find that you need the processing power of data explorer to do some pre-processing on your data before moving into other parts of, of your data state that way. Um, it does allow that uh, for multi-stage uh, uploads. So do it in, in chunks there and uh, download and ingest from your, your blobs. But it does open up into so many other environments through the, the API. So things like Kafka, Logstash, and various other SDKs, you can also make use of those and push the data into your, uh, your Data Explorer cluster as well. Once you've got it in there, there's a number of ways of, of getting to that. You can do it directly from the, the portal. Um, you can use Azure Data Explorer um, and other tools. Uh, Azure Data Explorer is good because it now has a native Custo kernel in it as well. So it becomes really easy to, to connect and write your queries natively in the, in the tool. The other nice bit is you don't actually have to move the data explicitly into it. You can make use of the querying power with external tables. So if your data is already coming into your data lake, you don't have to take that copy of it out. Uh, if it's already in there and you just want to, to do some exploration on it that are maybe helping to build your ML models uh, and you want that extra processing power, you can set it up with external tables. It leaves the data at source. It just you know finds an efficient way to query that data, to bring it in, 
uh, and run your, your power across that. So again, some nice ways of, of making use of existing data uh, with the, the power of the query engine through that as well. And the other option is, uh, and it's as you've seen with a number of uh, different services uh, in Azure, that instead of trying to build a new blade into the portal, that they're spinning it off into its own uh, little query tool or, or other you know, management tool for those particular services. And there's one for Data Explorer that's available there as well. And it gives you a nice platform of being able to manage some of your data ingestion from there. Uh, you can do your querying from there. You can open and save the, the query files so they can be reused. And you can actually build out some simple dashboards from there as well. So again, seeing what's happening before you might want to push that into some other tools for consumption there as well. Okay, so let's have a look at how we get things going. So I have my Azure Data Explorer opened up here. And the first thing you're going to have to do is make sure you've got the Custo extension installed. So from your extension manager, search for it there. If it's not already you know, installed for you, then uh, set that up and configure it there. Reasonably straightforward. If you're familiar with, uh, with things like VS Code as well, the same sort of approach uh, is available in there. You're able to tell that you've got it by then having a, a Custo kernel available. So with uh, all the other tools that we have available here in uh, Azure Data Studio uh, from the native SQL and uh, out to, to PowerShell and uh, various others, uh, making sure that we've got the Custo kernel available is important from there. Now, before you actually go ahead and build your own cluster, you don't actually have to do that if you just want to, to have a try at it, to see what the language is like, to start learning with things. Microsoft have actually uh, provided a test environment to do that. So the, the help.custo.windows.net, you sign in with uh, your, your Microsoft account into there. And that opens up a number of databases that are already preloaded with data for you to just learn the querying language. And because it's read-only, uh, you're not going to you know, get rid of anything that's there already. Um, so it's kind of nice that way of, of letting you play with it, letting you learn the language, the concepts that are, that are there, without going to the expense of finding your own data sets, loading them, building your own cluster, etc. So you go to get your connection string. Uh, going to the portal and grabbing the, the URI from it from there, uh, setting your your kernel, and then we connect um, using the we drop the the HTTPS off it when we put the connection uh, name in to the to the connection, and that'll go ahead and and connect through there. So if you're a little bit familiar with SQL, um, the concepts are going to be kind of similar, and the logic you'll see in the way that the queries are built up will actually make a lot of sense as well. And particularly if you understand how a SQL query actually works. So although it's written as select from where, et cetera, the actual processing kind of goes the other way around. It goes to, to where first of all, uh, and the, the select being the last part on it, of just projecting out what's left out of your result set. Uh, maybe if you're more familiar with uh, with something like uh, with link to SQL and the structure that comes through from that, it will make a lot of sense that way as well. There's also a difference between what are effectively DDL commands and DML commands. So what are you doing in terms of the, the metadata and the structure and the, the tables, et cetera, that are there, as opposed to actually querying data out from those tables. So if you're query starts with uh, the period, you're effectively telling it that this is going to be a metadata in your operation. I want to find out something about the structure uh, or to do something and process uh, some new structure within my database. So my show tables is literally that. It's telling me what tables exist in this test cluster. So I can see all the, the various samples that, that Microsoft have made available on here. Uh, there's some of their big and um, data sets, the, the storm events uh, is a big one there. There's some uh, COVID data, a lot of things around uh, data that is suitable for time series and ML analysis on there as well. Um, 
They used to also have the, the New York taxi data set on there, but that looks as though it's now been removed, uh, which is unfortunate because that's quite a cool one to, to play with as well. Anyway, we'll have a look at the, the storm events. So again, if I start to look at, you know, what is the, the way that we'd structure a query there, we start with the table name. So effectively, we don't need to do the from, it's implied by the start of that. And then it's the, the pipe uh, is the separator between each step within that query. So my first thing there is I go, well, I want to filter it to only look at uh, event types that are water spouts. And summarize is the same as my uh, group by in SQL. So I want to you know, summarize that up and I just want to get the, the count as my, um, my aggregate function across there. So if I run that, it tells me, oh great, I've got 288 events, uh, storm events that involved a water spout over that data set. So that's kind of cool and kind of nice to start with or just to see something that's there. But let's have a look at doing something which is our own data uh, and actually have something useful from there. So what I've got set up, I've got a couple of uh, SQL databases I'm running a little bit of workload against them. And you see the, you're just the standard Azure metric stuff that's going through there. But what I've done is I've come in from my diagnostic settings and the metrics that I've got generated on these databases. I'm doing a couple of uh, targets for that. I'm sending one of them out to a storage account. Um, so that's one place where it, it can send it out and store it. Uh, I can set the retention on that. At the moment, I've got it unlimited because I want to keep this data set available for something that I can pull in later. But I can also stream this out to uh, an event hub as well. And the event hub bit is what we're going to look at first of all. So again, I've got that defined. Um, and I'm going to go through and see how we can actually do some ingestion from that. So let me first of all, I'll make sure I've got my crystal connection. I'm going to connect to my DB metrics one here. Okay, so the first thing is I'm going to create a new table. Uh, it's gonna be my diagnostic metrics. And this is the final data that I'm gonna get out from there. So looking back at what my metrics are gonna send through, I was gonna get the, the time when it happened, I'm going to get the server and database name that it was related to, the particular metric. So we look back at uh, you know, what sort of metrics were coming out from there, uh, things like the, the CPU percentage, the log IO percentage, data IO percentage, that sort of information is going to be coming through. And then I'm going to get the, the numbers that are related to that. So you know, what's the minimum over that period? What's the maximum? What's the average, et cetera? You know, what time grain? is that metric being captured across. So this is gonna be my final table that we're gonna use. So yeah, all good there, it's telling me success from that. However, the way that it's pushing this out through my event hub is it's gonna create JSON records in, the, in the, mid, the, the interim part there. So what I want to do is say, well, let me create another table and this is gonna receive my raw JSON from uh, event hub. I define that as a dynamic data type, so it fits in with the, with the JSON type there. Now, my all to merge statement is my way of going, I've got to this table already, I want to change some of the properties on it. And what I'm gonna do is on my raw records, I'm gonna say, well, I'm gonna process those immediately they arrive, so I don't actually need any retention it. So I'm gonna tell it that, you know, do a soft delete on it as soon as it's processed. It's also going to be the target of streaming data from Event Hub. So overall, I'll set my streaming ingestion enabled for the table as well. And then I need to tell it from that incoming data format, how am I going to, to map that JSON? So there's a, there's a little bit of a, a mapping that's needed to tell it roughly where the header of the uh, the JSON properties are. So each of the, the objects in there. So I'm telling it that I've got uh, a records array as my first part 
in that, that JSON record. So that's now understanding what's going to come into my raw table, first of all. How I get that to my uh, final table is I create a function. So what that's going to do is going to start from my raw table. I'm going to expand out at the, the records property. I'm going to filter that. If it doesn't have a metric name, it's going to give me no value in, in what I'm going to be processing. So I'm just going to throw that away. If it's you know something that's that's come through without the full information, let's just forget about it. And my project is effectively like my select statement. So what I'm going to do is then convert things into the appropriate data types. So I'll take out my time and convert it to a date time. The uh, the resource ID, it's your, you standardize your resource ID. So it's got the whole path down to my uh, final server name and database name. I don't need the whole thing. I don't care about the whole thing. I want to just split that out. But because it is a resource ID, it's kind of known what the structure is. So I can easily say which part of that resource ID has my server name and which part has my database name. And I can run those functions onto that at the time when I'm pulling the individual JSON record out as well. And then get my metric and my values for each bit there. So the function's defined. What we now do is the final step on this side of the, the processing is to apply the policy that says, Whenever a new record arrives in my raw table, so my source here is my raw table, the query I'm going to apply on that is my function. That's going to be uh, enabled and transactional. And it's going to apply to my final table, my diagnostics and metrics table. So you basically go on, here's the policy on, on your final table. Go and look up the data as it comes in from the other table there. Cool, that's our first bit. So that's kind of the receiving side is set up. I then need to go back in and set things up from the, the publishing side of it. So from the, from the event hub side. So let's go back, let's go to my event hub. So I'm not doing it from there, I want to do it from my um, my Data Explorer instance. So we're going to a higher level to configure this. And I'm going to come up and look at my data ingestion here from my, my Data Explorer database. I'm going to add a new connection here, which is going to be from Event Hub. Give it a name. event hub from my metrics one. There's no compression on that. There's no existing properties on that. And then for my table name, I use the, the JSON one that it's pointing into. So at this point, it's, it's telling me I'm pulling it out from, uh, from the event hub in JSON format. I'm telling you it's JSON format in here as well. And then I need to tell it what the uh, the mapping is. So that bit that says which part of the, the JSON object am I taking my core data out from. Go ahead and create that. That will check everything off from there. I've already got stuff flowing into my event hub, as you can see here, there's activity onto that. Um, so that's pushing something from that side. It's setting things up with the, the routing there. That'll hook everything in. And start to, to look to send that data through. Okay, we'll leave that in the background because that normally takes up to about five minutes for the, the data flow to get started. My table exists, so I can query it, but we'll see if there's nothing through on that as yet. The other way we can do this is pull it in directly from blob storage. So going back to that where I had uh, my diagnostic settings, I've already also got it going to a storage account. 
So that's another option that I can do from here as well. So on this one, we can then go through it and start to, to look at it in, in a different format here as well. So I go back to my the database. So now doing it through dataexplorer.azure.com, I can do ingest new data. And this is where it gives me some nice little helpers. So if I jump back and actually look at this data bit on here, there's some nice bits here around the, this one-click ingestion that will let you pick various other data sources to start pulling things through from. And I can even you know, use it to, again, to go back to an event hub and pull things through from there as well. But let's go back uh, to here. And again, I've got my, my connection to my cluster. They're set up uh, by default. I'm going to create a new table to, to load this into. with the, the blob name on there. It's from a blob container. And then I need to grab my shared access signature to my container. Copy that. And that then identifies that I've got uh, some files there that is pulled out. I can look in, in editing the schema. so. Is there anything I want to change on what's being pulled in from here as well? So uh, I can start to look at things like, do I want to, to change the, the data types, for example? Is there any of these that I want to, um, to ignore? Um, but everything is fine at that point. So I'm going to go ahead and say, start ingestion from there. So again, that'll start to, to do the preparation, you know, things like creating the tables that I need, creating the, any of the, the mapping parts of that from the, the JSON out into the, the final table. So it's starting to find the, uh, the data from there. And it's found 125 total blobs on my uh, my container. So that's been running for a little bit. In fact, there's a good bit more out of there. So it's pulling it through from each of these where I can see what's happening at that point. And once that's ready, I will be able to, to do a, a preview on the data from there as well. So I'm going to leave that running. I'm going to come back and look at a, a query. So if I refresh my database here, we can see there's the the function I created for the first part for my um, event hub ingestion, along with the two tables related to that. But I've also got the table created from my uh, blob storage ingestion. I can see if there's anything in there. So it's telling me already that I do have some data that's already existing in that one by the looks of it, um, but it's not quite complete yet. So it's going to come back and say, yep, there's too much on there for the, the initial stuff. So we've got a fair amount of data that's already coming in from that, which is kind of cool. We've got plenty in there, uh, and that's still running. So there's a little bit more to finish on that. But that's cool. So we can start to, to look at some of this as well. And let me open. OK. So again, some basic stuff. What do we have? There's half a million records in there already um, and still more to come in. So let's look at some more around the, the query language. So again, the extend part here is, is something where I can do to add a function uh, onto any of the columns. So it's, it's like converting the, you know, the, the, 
the values in there for every record. So again, I took the whole resource ID in at this point. I don't want the whole resource ID. I'm just going to say, give me the, the database name. So I'm applying that extend onto it and saying, give me this new column that's based upon the resource ID. And as well as project to say, give me these particular columns, I can just project away. If I only want to, to remove one column, it's a much easier way to say, you know, everything except resource ID. And then I'm going to take the first 100 records out of that. So we can see from here, that's given me out my uh, database name has been extracted. I can see the various metrics that were available and the time that they were logged, and then all the related values that, that went with them. That's not so bad, but it's, it's not the most useful thing of that data at this point in time. So what else can we do with it? Well, let's group it up into 15 minute averages. I don't care about the, the, the one minute granularity that's available in there. 15 minutes is perfectly fine for me. So I can group that up based upon the database name and the metric name and use this bin function here to define what my grouping is going to be for that. So every 15 minutes on my time value, I'm going to take the database name, the metric name, that time value from there and my 15 minute average. And I can also do a sort on things there as well. So let's see what that brings us back. So we can see from this, looking at um, the set of values here, for example, we can see that the time has been grouped up into the, the 15 minute in intervals. The time for that is always the start of the range that you're, you're grouping it into. So just to be aware of that, whether it's the start on the end is the start value uh, out of that set of time values that would be put in there. So I can see I'm now starting to get something where I can get a bit more use. I can start to see some trending on this with uh, some time series stuff. There's some familiarities with uh, with SQL. So things like distinct is the same in there. So I can actually see what metrics have actually been consumed from that. And again, I can extend out, you know, use this function to extract out my database name and then see you know, what databases are actually in there. So I can see I've got my two databases that are providing data for this. There's also this, the, the let function, which I use to define things dynamically, which is really cool. So um, I want to only look at the metrics that are DTU related. So I can define a separate table that's got these names and define them manually. And then I'm going to look at joining that back to my main table. And again, taking out my database name, doing my 15 minute grouping and take the values from there. So instead of having all of those uh, metrics available, I've now limited down to just those three. So just the, uh, the DTU use, the DTU limit and the DTU consumption percent that's coming through from there. The other cool thing is that within the, uh, the portal here and within the, um, the Data Explorer query tool, I can also tell it to do that as a chart directly in there. So I can start to see more visually what's been happening with that. So I can see you know, my two databases are pulled through there um, for one particular uh, for metrics. Um, and doing that as, as a time chart so we can see what's been going along over time. So there was a bit back at the end of February where it got a big good bit of use. There's been not a lot through for the, the couple of weeks since then, but then it's back on to, to doing some stuff from there as well. And you can see there's a you know, bit of a different load on each of the, the two from there. Another interesting one, um, again, I can apply um like a case statement onto this so i'm going to you know instead of using the true values i'm going to bucketize them up you know depending upon you know what the actual value of the maximum i received was so i can look through that and see you know what's been happening over time there so i can see you know for my my hammer db1 you know it never got above 20 percent, so it's only ever showing one as my bucket value 
whereas my other one has you know occasionally crept up to uh, up to 50 percent on the DTU consumption so it's it's showing as a value too but it's never got above the 50 percent so nothing's reached up into the the four value from there but again that nice bit of being able to render it as a time chart on there So that's great that we can start to look at things. We can get some insights from the data. We can see some of the uh, the, the 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 trends on it through the the inbuilt charts that are available. But it's not the most useful way of consuming things. So the web app's kind of cool for that, and we'll show, we'll show it with some of the bits around um, the dashboards as well to finish off with. But there is native connections from a lot of other visualization tools. So Power BI, Tableau, Grafana, Kibana, Excel can all hook in to, to Azure Data Lake Explorer and take the data out so you can then start to look at it and consume it more directly into those tools, which are obviously far more valuable to the business. But there is also an ODBC connector to it as well, which means that any custom application can be set up and send a query and pull that data back. So it gives you immense flexibility on, on how you actually go about querying that. So if I jump back to look at my, uh, my web one. Um, that's still running on that one, but that should be okay if we jump through and have a look on the, the dashboard side of things. I think that's still going to be slow because of my extra data volume. There we go. So easy enough from here. Um, the first thing I would do is um, if I click on edit here. I can set up my data sources. So you know, just setting up my, my data source here back to my cluster and to particular, to particular database. And then within each of the, the cards, I'm simply just defining uh, the query that I want. So in this one, we're just working out what's the, the various metric names that were created on there. I can go back, and that's given me my list in here as well. On this one, so I can take this query, and it's telling me oh, there wasn't any results from that one. Well, let's jump back and just make sure that that is the case. See what we're getting from there. Yeah, it's okay. So fair enough, it's telling me there's nothing from there. But is that because there's nothing into this table as yet? Okay, it has consumed through from there. But it's because we don't actually have an exact match on this CPU. So if I take it to CPU instead, let's run that. Cool, that's going to give me some values back. So let me take that and update my query back in here. Apply those changes. And why did that not want to pick something from there? That's because it didn't copy that bit back properly. Run that, apply that, and we can see that by defining that as a as a visual in here, it's the same thing that's reflected back. I could switch it that way and get it as the, the format on there. And I've got some control over the type of chart that I want to do, so I can start to pick things in there and work through th with, with that. I can have that set up and auto-refresh it. So, you know, I can have this up and using it live as uh, as data comes in and actually see what's on there and obviously define the number of dashboards I want. And this again, it's something again as that uh, initial preview before going on and actually making use of it into something that's a real tool like Power BI. Awesome, that covers what I wanted to go through on there. So I think I will check back and see if we have any questions to follow up with. Uh, well, no one has raised their hand and I see no questions in the chat. 
So what I am going to do right now is uh, I thought I'd be able to unmute people individually, but I can't apparently. So I'm just going to enable everyone to, uh, to unmute if they want. Uh, so if you've got a question you want to ask, then uh, you should uh, be able to unmute now. Yes, let's see, that would be the case. So um, feel free to, to speak up, or if you want, you can type something in the chat. Uh, somebody has typed in the chat. Uh, so Ashok is saying, would that ingest data from Data Lake or Hadoop clusters, Spark cluster? Cool. So yes, that was one of the bits I, I mentioned that it can hook things on directly to, to Azure Data Lake with uh, an external table so that it leaves the data in place there, pulls it out as you need it. Um, I do believe it does with the queries, it will have predicate pushed down into Data Lake as well, uh, depending upon the format of your data there. So you will get the efficiencies in what it's able to pull back. Um, in terms of Hadoop and Spark, um, does it have a connector into, uh, into that? Um, I believe it would be able to through the APIs um, to, to have a way of ingesting through that. But um, as they're likely to also be based upon Data Lake anyway, then it will be your data lake would be the, the way to set up the external table for that. Um, Grav, does it scale for computing? Yes, you've got that bit at the start where I, I showed you on setting up the cluster where there's a choice of the, the different um, VMs that can underpin it. Um, that gives you the ability to, to go back and, and scale those separately. So you can go and say, I want to, to use a different uh, VM to underpin my cluster uh, and increase your, your scalability that way. Uh, you will also get through the auto scaling, will scale out the number of nodes that are there. So again, you're adding more compute power and more memory over that uh, as it's set up that way as well. Awesome. And you got kudos from Nick. Thank you, uh, Nick. Um, another quest, couple of questions coming in now. So desktop application, uh, use Azure Data um, Studio. Uh, it's set up with, uh, as showed at the start, with the, the Custo kernel for that. That will allow you to connect directly and run your queries directly from there. Uh, in terms of mobile, no, I don't believe there is a, a native mobile app. Uh, however, there is the web app there um, that I was using at the end, which, uh, yeah, obviously you could use on any platform where you can get uh, an internet connection. So you could theoretically do it that way through, through mobile. Um, again, depends what you produce at the end of it. If you're using it to, to drive... Uh, Power BI, then obviously you've got something like the, the Power BI mobile app, which can then be hooked directly back through to your, your Data Explorer data sets and generating your, your visuals based upon that. Is Splunk of any use for similar work? Um, in some ways, yes. Uh, I haven't done a great deal with Splunk uh, natively. Um, there is obviously the scope that you could pull the data in from Splunk into Data Explorer and query it from there. Um, how it compares in terms of performance between Splunk against uh, Azure Data Explorer, I haven't done anything uh, around that side of things for comparative performance, but it's certainly feasible to push uh, your data into Data Explorer and query from there as well. Everybody wants to type tonight instead of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope the come off mute works. Daniel, yes, it does use uh, the Custo syntax for querying it. So because it's a different query engine, 
than uh, the SQL query engine. Um, you you do need to do that, but it is something which is very very easy to to transfer across. The only bit you have to think about is that bit of starting with the where clause effectively, and then adding your query on top of that. Um, but if you understand the the concepts of SQL, and it gives you all things like the like windowing functions as well. So there's a lot of the similar power than normal SQL. So the the translation between one and the others I've I've generally found to be pretty quick to do. <clears throat> right. Do we have any more questions? Oh no! Just a. Uh... Kudos from uh, Asher. So that's uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, well, um, well. Thank you, um, thank you uh, very much for that, Martin. That was very, very insightful. Uh, I'll just see if Daniel is typing a question or saying. Oh no, just thanks. Okay. Fantastic. So, um, so as people who, who've attended our groups uh, for a long time would know, we very much appreciate our presenters and our speakers and the people who take so much time to um, to prepare all of these things. And you know, if this uh, just because it's a virtual event, you know, we don't want to stop that from uh, being able to show our appreciation uh, to you. So, Martin, thank you, uh, thank you very much. And here's your uh, here's your bottle of wine. You thank you very much for that. Much appreciated. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> okay. So, um, so as Damien said at the beginning, uh, we do got a few open spaces. Um, we have somebody lined up for April already, but at the moment, March. Uh, sorry, this is March. Sorry, we have someone lined up for May already, uh, but uh, Mar uh, April is still open if somebody wants to uh, wants to put their hand up to do a talk. Um, please reach out to either me or Damien or just uh, send an email to baug at outlook.com.au. And uh, yeah, we'd love to hear, uh, hear what you have in mind uh, for either April or any other time later later during this year. So um, fantastic. Thank you so much, Martin. Thank you to everybody who attended the meeting tonight. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again next month. Oh, Thanks for the opportunity, and uh, I hope everyone got plenty from the session. Thanks, guys. Cheers.